come from Germany. He is a biomechanist who does his daily work mostly with the drawers. Uh, we have a pleasure to have here Mr. Frank Lehmann to speaking about the biomechanics of javelin throwing. Welcome, Frank. Okay, thank you. Okay, dear coaches and scientists, dear guests and dear Temu and other Finnish colleagues, many thanks for your invitation to come to Finland and speak about javelin throw. This is a great honor for me, and maybe it has something to do with our work, but I know in Finland is done a really good work to support the javelin throwers and the performances show this. In the last years, some German coaches took part at this conference, but in this year I'm alone. The reason is an important training camp in preparation of the next season. That's why I'm alone from Germany and I have heard nobody from Austria <laughs> and one person from Switzerland. It's important for me. I often make presentations among the coaches at several events. We have a similar conference in Germany every two years and some international or some successful coaches are invited to this conference, but it not, uh, it's only for German coaches, but I think it will be changed. There is a cooperation between IAAF and our track and field association. Next year we will start a closer cooperation in coaching and education and maybe in the next throwing conference in Germany will take part some foreign coaches. Uh, but I'm not so often held and you remark it, my presentation in English. I hope you will understand me. If not, please ask. Perhaps I need a little help or a little support for the questions. We use in Germany some terms which are usual in Germany because of historical reasons but perhaps not in other countries. I try to declare these terms. I hope you will understand me. What I plan to do, my first presentation today, I want to speak about selectic, selected biomechanical aspects of the javelin throwing based on our system of movement analysis. We have developed a special database I will present you. This is the initial and final point of our training, scientific support and counseling. I'm not only a biomechanic <laughs> clinical worker, I'm, uh, I, we say, a scientist in the training sign, and we are responsible for the counseling of the coaches too. In the second presentation tomorrow, I will present you our system we use actually in Germany our system of training scientific support and counseling. And I will present you as an example of javelin, of course, but we use the same system in disco throw and in shot put. And the important question today uh, is how are the top performances characterized? What is necessary to throw 90 meters and above and to throw 70 meters and above? This is the structure of my presentation. At first, some prelim preliminary remarks to my institute and to my own. Then, uh, some selected biomechanical aspects of javelin throwing. Uh, what are the important motion technical parameters of javelin throwing uh, we investigate? Then, I will present you our motion analysis of the javelin movement. And the main point today is some selected results of the motion analysis. And finally, I want to give you a little summary. At first, some remarks about the Institute for Applied Training Science. The IAT is the successor institute of the FKS in the former GDR. It was the research institute for the top performance sport in the former GDR. It was founded in 1991 according to the reunification contract. About 100 employees still remained from 635, 635 formerly after intensive investigations. The institute is supported by the federal government in Berlin. 
and the general object objective is to support of German athletes at the preparation of a successful participation at international main competitions. Therefore, the additional term applied appears at our institute's name. We not only assist, we not only assist the coaches, we support and counsel them at the finding of general deficits, at the planning and evaluation of the training, at the implementation of training means and methods in their training, at the development of new training devices, and so on. Actually, about 1,000 German athletes in 24 kinds of sports, 18 in the summer sport and 6 in the winter sport, are cared for. And now to my own person. I teach at the DHFK, it was the sport university in the former GDR, after finishing my studies there, I was responsible for the research and coaches' education in the sprinting events until the end of the 80s. In 1987, I was a member of a <coughs> DHFK delegation. The leader was Professor Bauersfeld, visiting Finland, Finland for an exchange of experiences besides others at the University of Jyväskylä, not so far away from here. Besides the sprint coaches, a lot of actual top coaches in the throwing events studied there. This is an advantage for my actual work. Perhaps you know names like Helge Zölgau, Jürgen Schuld, the, actu uh, the actual world record holder in disco throw. Perhaps you know uh, Werner Goldman, the coach of Robert Harding, the former coach, Maria, Maria Rachel, Sven Lang, the coach of uh, David Stoll and Christina Schwanitz and many others, and last but not least, the German head coach Idris Konczynska and many others. His university was closed and incorporated in the University of Leipzig as an own faculty on 1992, and I changed to the IIT at 2001 after three works, after three years of work as a head coach in Saxony. Since then, I work in the sewing events, first of all. At the present, I am involved in the education at the university, but the coaches' education is not the main fo focus today. Except in the international coaches course, which is uh, held every year for foreign coaches in Leipzig. And finally, a little story. I have brought a little paper with me, and it's a special book for coaches about the te ideal technical model in several kinds of sports. And this is about javelin. And if I had brought this paper in the 80s with me and they found it in my package, they had prevented my departure to Finland and had sent me into prison. <laughs> You cannot imagine that time. I often remember that time because it is very actually. Last Sunday, <coughs> we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the breaking down the wall, separated East and West Germany, separated whole Europe. Our tra training, scientific support, and counseling contains javelin and discus throw, shot put, and since two years, Degaslen and Hepteslen, all, all German top athletes in these events, among them the three actual world champions, you see it in the pictures above, are involved. And our mark is a very close cooperation with their coaches. <coughs> and I hope all our three actual world champions will have the chance to defend their titles next year in Peking or in Beijing because they ha all have some problems, different problems. Uh, Robert Harding, David Stoll had an operation last month. It's a knee joint, but they started with their training. And you know, Christina Obock fell after her childbirth, started the training last month. And we all hope they will be fit next year to defend their titles. Okay, let's go to the contents. Uh, some selected bi biomechanical aspects. These are the parameters you know influencing the 
throwing distance. It's the release speed, it's the angle of release, it means the direction of the release speed, the heat of release, the acceleration of gravity, and plus minus delta O. It's a difference in the throwing distance caused by aerodynamics, air resistance, javelin characteristics, and so on. And this is, I think, maybe a com uh, complicated formula, but it reflects this connection. According to a physical law, the law of the inclined throw, we call it so in Germany, it shows this. And if you see it from the point, from, of a from the mathematical point of view, then you can remark there are some different influences. The height of release is had a small has a small influence uh, if you throw if you uh, increase your height of release about 10 centimeters then you will increase your throwing distance about 10 centimeters. Then you see V square, V square uh, it had the most influence to the throwing distance and you see the reflecting parameters, mathematical functions, cosinus and sinus, uh, according to the angle of release. And it means from the point of view, from this point of view, there must be an optimum about 45 degrees. And all things in the practice we found can confirm this formula. And we have a special term too in Germany. We have the so-called aerodynamic quality. And what does it mean? It means there is a difference between the real throwing distance and the resistance according to this formula. We measure the height, we measure the release, angle of release, we measure the release speed and calculate the throwing distance and compare it with the real distance. And there is a difference. Uh, the real uh, distance must be more than 100%. And if it's below 100%, uh, then the, the throw head has a very bad quality. I will give you some further information later to this topic. How can we measure the release speed? There are several methods of instant measurement of the release speed in Chevalin's throw. In Germany, we use this system. We have a reflector band behind the upper end of the Chevalin grip. We uh, fix it before on the Chevalin. And we have two laser light barriers in a distance of one meter, one meter, and we calculate about this system the release speed. I know you have in Finland uh, a very good system too, maybe <laughs> earlier developed than in Germany, and you uh, a system with using of infrared cell gates, Rico, yeah, is right, and you can measure additionally to ask the release, uh, the angle of release too. I think there are some disadvantages, and one disadvantage of this method is a two-dimensional measurement, and we found some difference because this, uh, by using this system, and in comparison to our system, I will show you later. And OM results uh, confirmed all results getting up to today. There is a very close correlation between release speed and throwing distance, both in men and in women. And you see here the results in the women and the female use uh, by using our system, our laser system, and in men and male use, it is true. And I said it already, it confirmed our results finding up today. Okay. What is the release speed? The release speed is the result of the action of force and it equates the acceleration of the javelin. That means the release speed, you see, this is the acceleration curve during a, a special javelin movement. The release speed is the integral, where is the laser pointer? 
under this curve. It's the area under this curve over the time during the javelin movement. If you increase this area, you will increase the radius speed. And then we had uh, a beginning of the main acceleration and we have, it's a special term in Germany, the main acceleration begins before the touchdown, but we define the beginning of the main acceleration in this way because of the used measurements. And we had, of course, an end of this acceleration at the releasing point. And the release speed is the sum of the velocity of the javelin at the beginning in the main acceleration phase at this moment, which javelin, which velocity has the javelin in this moment, and the increase of the velocity during the main acceleration phase, delta V, area under the acceleration curve I already mentioned. And both together result the whole value speed. And I will give you some results at first. Later I will give you some remarks to the used methodology, but according to our topic, I compared top athletes with other group of athletes. And you see here the throwing distance. You see here the javelin's velocity at the touchdown of the left leg at the beginning of the main acceleration. You see the increase of velocity during the main acceleration the release speed and the percentage of the increase of velocity during the main acceleration. There are some groups and the upper group represent top performances. Only five athletes, but that's why these are top performances because <laughs> only a few women are able to throw in this way. And the results are the follows. Differences between the groups 55 to 60 and 60 to 65. They had a higher increase of velocity during the main acceleration exclusively. And then the next is, I think, remarkable. The significant differences of the throwing distances and the release speed between the group 60 and 65 and the group above 65 to 75 are caused by significant differences of the javelin's velocity at the touchdown of the left leg, while not significant differences in the increase of the javelin's velocity during the main acceleration were found. And the same at the men. It's the same way always. We have only five throwers with throwing distances above uh, 88 meters and above. And in comparison to the other groups, similar to the women, the significant differences between the group 76 to 81 and 81 to 86.5 are caused by the increase of the javelin's velocity exclusively. You see it here in the yellow fields. The significant difference between the groups 86, 81 to 86.5 and above 88 meters, are caused by significant differences in both velocities. Velocity at the beginning and the increase of velocity during the main acceleration. These are the results, and I presented these results last year in the throwing conference uh, in speaking to our javelin coaches, and I will think we discussed the conclusions because they are remarkable. It means circa one about, uh, one about about one third of the release speed is generated by the pre-acceleration of the whole system, thrower and javelin, up to the touchdown of the left leg, at up to the beginning of the main acceleration phase. And about two thirds of the release speed are generated by the acceleration or is generated by the acceleration of the javelin during the main acceleration phase from the touchdown of the left leg to the release. And there is no continuous development in the cross-sectional comparison. Top performances are characterized by higher velocities of the javelin at the beginning of the main acceleration and only at the men higher increases of velocity during the main acceleration. And something think over and think it's very easy 
to increase the velocity uh, at the beginning of the main acceleration. That's why it's very important that the increase of the javelin's velocity up to the touchdown of the left leg must be uh, in an effective way, not effective to accelerate only the javelin too early. I will give you some further information to this. Okay, there are two important aspects to reach a large soaring distance. At first, we must generate a high release speed, and secondly, we must to transform it a high release speed into the throwing distance effectively. And these two tasks, I will give you some further information and results. And that's why, to investigate it, we need an extensive motion ana analysis in order to determine the deciding parameters of the release speed and the quality of release to formulate requirements depending on the throwing distance to identify individual reserves at every thrower and to check the effect of several interventions in the training. If we do something in the training, in order to change something, we must check the effect and that's why we need this motion analysis. And now, what are the important movement technique parameters? It's not all, these are not all, but I think these are the important. At the first, to increase the release speed, we have the running up. We have the change over uh, from the running up to the beginning of the main acceleration. We have the activity of the support leg. We have the delay of throw. We have the activity of the brace leg. We have the crea creation of pretension one in the part of trunk shoulder. The creation of pretension two, we separate them because in life it's very difficult to separate uh, because of the short duration. Creation of pretension two, shoulder throwing arm, and the main acceleration of the javelin. And I thought, said it already, we use special terms in Germany. This is a delay of throw. It's not the usual in other countries. That's why it means to hold back the throwing arm and shoulder before the main acceleration begins. We call it delay of throw or throwing, throwing delay. And at first, we have the quality of release. At first, the angle of release. The angle of attitude. The difference between the angle of attitude and the angle of release at release, the so-called, maybe it's more usual, the so-called uncorrected angle of attack and the angle of jaw. Okay, how do we investigate this? The kinematic motion is done both at important competitions and at all diagnostics. It is executed as a three-dimensional analysis of the video pictures uh, with 50 half frames. Both com cameras are hardware synchronized at every measure. One camera stands at the side, 90 degrees to the throwing direction, one camera behind the thrower in the throwing direction at the edge of the javelin in the throwing area outside. We use this at all competitions, German championships, at all international competitions too made it. The results of the motion analysis are integrated in a special database including several figures, videos and, and picture sequences. We call it MIS Javelin. Our database contains actually about 130 female throwers with 680 attempts and 140 male throwers with 740 attempts the throwing distances from 29.5 to 72.28 women and female use and from uh, 45 to 45.5 to 98.48 men and male use. And if you see the figures, it means both current javelin world records are included. This three-dimensional uh, three analysis is an important base and part of our work, of our biomechanical and training scientific support in Germany. 
Okay, some remarks to the used methodology. We have the motion analysis as a 3D analysis of the video motion. Before we can do it, we must calibrate. We must capture the spatial coordinates and you see we have the rotating diagonal line object in this way and we must rotate this line in order to calibrate the space in the sewing area in the main acceleration. And this is a live picture where I do it. And you see there are some special marks. And because of the rotated, I call it rotated, yes, maybe it doesn't also do them. Uh, because of the rotated camera during recording, an additional calibration work is necessary. Every frame we analyzed must be calibrated. And after capturing, we must transform the real space coordinates on the javelin throw area. We call it transformation of the zero point. Okay, when we have done it, what we will investigate, the base of our kinematic analysis is the javelin's movements with seven selected poses. Pose one is the takeoff of the third last step. Pose two is the takeoff of the crossover stride. Pose three is the touchdown after the crossover stride. Picture uh, pose four is 100 milliseconds of five half frames, half frames later. Pose five is the touchdown of the brace leg. Pose six is three half frames later. And pose seven is the javelin's release. And captured are all joints, points, and the javelin and upper edge and of the grip and top of these poses, at these poses. And secondly, the courses of the grip of the javelin. Upper edge, left and right shoulder, left and right hip, and the elbow, and the wrist of the javelin arm from pose one uh, to pose seven and two half, two half frames later. This is what we'll, what we'll do, and it takes about 90 minutes for one athlete. It takes a long time because it, it, it is ne necessary. As a second, analysis of the release parameters to estimate, uh, estimate the quality of release. Before we must check the accuracy of the calibration, the error of measurement should be smaller than 1%. If you have any question in this direction, you can ask me. But we prove, we check the accuracy of the calibration because it is necessary. This is the release, angle of release, you see it, and the angle of attitude. And this is the angle of jaw uh, in the rear view. The release speed is the quotient of the 3D javelin vase or the javelin pass. S, upper edge of the grip, is our point. From the release to the picture, one, uh, one point, uh, 0 0.04 seconds later, and the time. The angle of release is the angle between the direction of this way and the horizontal plane. The angle of attitude is the angle between the long axis of the javelin and the horizontal plane. And the angle of your, your, of your is the angle between the direction of the javelin's way and the long axis of the javelin in the y z plane it means in the rear view you see it at the right picture and we collected all data in uh, all this data in our database and the menu of this database maybe i can show you later if you want uh, is this one we have a video side and rear camera uh, the videos of this camera included including the possibility of comparison of two movies we have the picture sequence in the seven poses side and rear view we have a data table where are the main data are shown we have a figure course of the zg velocities and ways or zg of the uh, zg passes and we have a figure javelin position in the seven poses in different planes. We have a figure course of the angles and angular velocity, hip, shoulder, and upper arm axis in the 
XY plane and we have a uh, figure of courses of the torque. I would call it torque, maybe uh, the uh, separation of is a term you can understand better or maybe this term is more usual. And at finally we have a verbal evaluation of the movement including hints for the training. This is all we gave after even after every competition or after every diagnostics. We made this evaluation and gave the results to the coaches. I think it takes three and six days uh, after the competition. But this is a need and a lot of work is necessary to do this. Okay, and now I have two examples, the two actual world records. You see, this is Barbara Spartakova. We do the pictures or the videos. Uh, we made the analysis uh, for our own in Stuttgart in 2008, it was. And you see the poses. Uh, it's pose two in the picture sequence, pose three, pose four, pose five, pose six, and pose seven. And the same at the uh, rear view. And you can compare some results. I will discuss later and could compare it at this picture sequence. And the same at the men. I must say we do, uh, some colleagues from me do this uh, analysis. Uh, I came at 2001, I mentioned to the IIT and I take this videos and after seven or eight years I analysis I analyzed this video according to our actual system. You see the points I mentioned before in the background. And this is exceptionally for this competition the camera stands on the left hand side. Maybe there are some difficult conditions because of the shot put area you see in the background. We must go to the wrong side we usually take the pictures from the side of the throwing arm. Some words to the used methodology. methodology. According to our topic, requirements of 70s and 90 meters, some selected results of the motion analysis will present it. Therefore, all javelin throwers in our database are separated into three male and three female groups. In the following analysis, only the individual longest throws, it means the individual longest throwing distance, are included. And that's why we have three groups with a throwing distance of 55 to 60 meters, 16 women with a mean of 57.80 uh, throwing distance, we have a second group with a throwing distance 60 to 65, 50 women, and the uh, average is 61.68 meters. And we have the important group, according to our topic, with a throwing distance above 65 to 75 meters. These are five women with a mean of 68.62 meters. And in this group, uh, all uh, Winners, all yes, winners of the gold medal at all main competitions since 2006 are included. These are only five women. You know the names, perhaps. All winners at the World Championships and the Olympic Games and the European Championships. And the men, they have we, they have we have two, three, two, uh, three groups too with a throwing distance 75 to 81, 90 men with a mean 78.61. A second group 81 to 86.5 with a mean of 83.17 meters. And the most important group is the third group with a throwing distance about above 88 meters, uh, five throwers and the mean is 90.76. And the question now, we will discuss it, is what are the main differences between these groups? 
Okay. And according to our parameters I called before, you remember maybe I will give you some selected results. At first, the courses, the course of the ZG velocities and rays, or the ZG paths, at first at women. You see the several groups, black is the first, red is the second, and green is the third group. And you see the velocity of the ZG and the single phases of movement, one, two, three, and so on. And in order to understand it better, I will give you these pictures above. You see, one means the average velocity between the takeoff of the third last step to the takeoff of the impulse stride. And this is two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And you see there are no differences between 50 55 to 60 and 60 to 65 meters at the women. And there are significant higher velocities up to pose four, up to the touchdown of the brace leg. And significant higher velocity reduction in the braking phase and smaller ZG waves between, you see it here, smaller ZG waves between pose four and five at the top athletes. And the same at the men. There are no difference between 75 to 81 and 81 to 86.50 meters two, except the way between pose four and five. There are differences between all groups. And significant higher velocities up to pose five, up to the touchdown to the brace leg, a significant higher velocity reduction in the braking phase. You see it here. Higher velocities, significant higher reductions. And a smaller ZG way between pose four and five are at the top athletes. I show you an example of our database. You see it's Jelesny, no reduction of the velocity up to the touchdown of the brace leg and a very strong reduction of the velocity during the braking phase. And it's the same at Andreas Torgelsen and a decreasing way of the pass from the impulse stride to the, to the release. The same at Andreas Torgelsen, the same at Barbara Spadogova, uh, and the same at Christina Obockfell. And you see it, this is the characteristics for top performances. And we often found this way, or this data, and you see there are a lot of deficits. And these are, first of all, a loss of ZG velocity during impulse stride. A loss of ZG velocity after touchdown. You see it in this way. Uh, of the during delivery stride, after touchdown support leg of the delivery stride. Two small reduction, you see here, and compare to this, two small reduction uh, of velocity during braking phase from the touchdown of the brace leg to the release. And an increase, you see it here, an increase of the CG way in second phase of the delivery stride. And these are the main tasks to change in training. What does it mean, an effective activity of the support leg? What are the requirements? There are no loss of ZG velocity after the touchdown of the support leg. There are no loss of ZG velocity in the second half of the delivery stride. Effective pressure from the right foot. The pressure from the right foot to the right hip, right hip so-called hit to hip, must be uh, without knee extension, the right knee must go to the ground. If the knee is extended, the pressure goes to the whole body, including the upper body and the sewing arm, and the ZG way increases. 
Therefore, accelerate only the lower part of the body and delay the movement of the upper body relatively. These are the requirements, the biomechanical requirements, and we must find out the individual solutions to turn it the into the movement. This is our general kind of our work. Uh, at first, these are the biomechanical requirements, and now we have to look, we have to discuss with the coach how can we solve this problem, how can we put this deficit away, and there are maybe several individual solutions av uh, available possible. You see, this is the decreasing pass of the CG, decreasing in the in this phase I mentioned, and I will give you some pickles, uh, pictures. You see it in this way. The pressure goes to the whole body, the upper body is too much forward, and the brace leg is too steep, and some other mistakes appears, appear. This is a young athlete, uh, and this year he throw about uh, 80 meters, and he changed to our federal coach, to Boris Henry, or Boris Overkfell now, and I hope we will put away this deficit in the next year. And this, maybe you know this athlete, this is an athlete, uh, he know this deficit, and we want to put away this deficit, but we failed. He came to us uh, when he was 30 years old, and we tried three or four or five years, and uh, we failed uh, because of a general motor program. I will discuss it later. It is Mark Frank. He took part in several finals in World Championships, I think it was in 2005, 2007, and 2009. But he never reached a medal, he never reached a top performance. His personal best is about 84.50 meters. Comparison of selected parameters about the activity of the support leg. What is the result? And I have found three relevant parameters, three important parameters, the time of delivery stride, the angle of the hip, hip axis at the touchdown of the brace leg, and the maximum of the hip velocity uh, up to the touchdown of the brace leg, at the women and at the men. And here are several, several angles, and in order to understand these angles better, I will show you this picture. This is the top U, the X, Y plane, and you see the red line is the hip axis of the top athletes at the touchdown of the brace leg, and the blue line is the hip axis. And this way, yes, you can see it at men, is the hip axis at the touchdown of the brace leg. And you see, this figure shows us, show us, besides the differences in the G ways, there are significant smaller angles of the hip, hip axis, shorter times of the duration of the delivery stride, and higher hip velocities of the, at the top athletes, men and at, at women, and women, as the result of an ef effective activity of the support leg. This must be shown at the athletes or by the athletes and we must think over how can we manage it, how what can we do in the training to reach this objective. I will speak about this tomorrow and please keep in mind this figures the times 204 seconds and 108 88 seconds and 110, uh, 200 seconds, milliseconds, and 164 milliseconds. In all these parameters I mentioned are significant differences. And important are these. And these, and these, these are the maximum velocities 
of the hip axis. The next is the activity of the brace leg, and I will give you some pictures. At first is the touchdown of the brace leg, the so-called angle of the brace leg at the touchdown. The second is the knee angle at the touchdown, and the third is the knee angle during the breaking phase, uh, three half frames later. And you see the reduction of ZG velocities. There is a significant difference. That means the top performances have a bigger reduction of ZG velocities. You see the angle of the brace leg at the touchdown. At the top athletes, these angles are more flat. And you see, sorry, there are no difference in the other parameters. The same at the men, it's the same. There are a uh, bigger reduction of CG velocity in this way at the top athletes and in the angle of the brace leg at the touchdown and no difference in the others. As a result of the larger activity of the support leg, including the delay of the upper body forward movement, the touchdown of the brace leg is more flat and leads to a higher a reduction of CG velocity in the first part of the main acceleration. And you see it is an extremely uh, kind. It's Vadim Vasilevskis is a throw about 88.12 meters and he has an angle of the brace leg 35 degrees and you see all other parameters. The hip is forward. The knee went to the went to the ground and so on is a very good in this attempt a very good performance the next is the delay of throw it's a special term in germany i mentioned i declared it and second task at first we want to enlarge the way of the javelin in the main acceleration and secondly, to increase the pretension in the park of trunk shoulder. What are the relevant parameters? You see the parameters are the angle of the elbow at the touchdown, the angle of the shoulder at the touchdown, and you see what's the angle of the shoulder. Uh, in this picture, you can see it. It's the top view, and you can see the results i will give you the line and the release speed in this uh, table the shoulder axis touchdown at the brace leg it's this one the elbow angle at the touchdown of the brace leg is this one and the javelin's velocity at the touchdown of the brace leg and this is at the woman and there are no differences because the it's a shoulder axis, uh, some differences in the elbow angle between all throwers and the top throwers. You see this is the angle on average. And there are big differences, significant differences in the javelin's velocity according to the results I mentioned at the beginning. And this is the effective way without accelerate too early uh, you must reach a higher velocity of the javelin by using a higher running up speed by pr transform this higher uh, running up speed up to the touchdown of the brace leg and by the same level of the throwing delay and the same at the men and you see there are no differences uh, in the shoulder axis. The top athletes have smaller uh, angles and no significant differences in the lay of the throw means the same partly shorter ways of the javelin lead to a higher increases of velocity in the top athletes. And the reason is clear, higher maximum acceleration of the javelin during the main acceleration phase. 
And secondly, more pre-tension in the trunk shoulder as a result of the higher activity of the support leg I mentioned before. The right hip is, more is, is moved more forward and the same uh, delay of the shoulder and it, lead, it leads to a higher, more pretension in the trunk shoulder as a result of this higher, higher activity. And what is the result of this? The result is the maximum of the shoulder velocity and there is a very high correlation between the maximum of the shoulder velocity and the release speed at the woman female use. And you see these two pictures, a very close and a very high significant correlation, significant connection between both. And this means the maximum of the shoulder velocity as a result of a higher pretension of the trunk shoulder of the body is the most important parameter to improve the release speed. Similar to, if you want to use the whiplash effect, you must accelerate and break after this the handle of a whip. You cannot do it in this way, you must accelerate extremely the handle of the whip. And if the throwing arm is sufficiently delayed and at the whip, is this the case? <laughs> if the throwing arm is sufficiently delayed, you can produce a high velocity at the end of the whip. This connection is very useful for the German uh, javelin throwing. To generate the pretension in the trunk shoulder part, a higher pretension in the trunk shoulder part of the thrower is generated after an effective support uh, activity of the support leg. A large amount of the reduced speed after the touchdown of the brace leg and a good delay of the th throw as shown. These three parts are necessary in order to generate a high pretension in the trunk shoulder. And this appears as a high torque or a high separation of between hip axis and shoulder axis. You see this picture, this is the top view, and you see this is the hip axis, this is the shoulder axis, and this is the axis of the upper arm. And the differences between these axles are shown, uh, are investigated, and will show some deficits or some advantages. And you see it will, be play, it will play a role. You see the difference between the shoulder axis and the upper arm in this way. And this means 180 degree, it means zero torque, zero degree torque. This means it's minus. And if you have a torque between or in separation between shoulder axis and upper arm, it is plus. And these are the results uh, at women and at men. And the difference between the hip axis and the shoulder axis confirmed this. There are at both men and women, top athletes have a, high a significant higher torque between hip and shoulder axis at the touchdown of the brace leg. These are the results of a good activity of the support leg and a good uh, level of the throwing delay. The pretension in the part shoulder upper arm is generated after during the acceleration of the, uh, the throwing shoulder and the relatively delayed throwing arm. Because of the velocity of the movement, we must consider the course of the torque. It is clearly, uh, it takes a all at all 80 or 100 milliseconds and we cannot uh, investigate it this correctly by using the video we must course uh, we must take the course of these velocities and you see from the top view you see this red are the shoulder axis green are the upper arm and blue are the hip axis and you see there is no 
no talk at the beginning and you see there will be appeals and talk and it will dissolve at the release. And we have the according figure to this. And you see this torque between upper arm and shoulder axis in this red line. And this is a good example. You see it's Barbara Spadagova at her world record. The torque between shoulder axis and the screwed upper arm increases, red line, during dissolving the torque between hip and shoulder axis, blue line in the right figure. This is a sign for a good whiplash effect. And I give you an example for a not sufficient uh, pretension in the part of shoulder upper arm. You see it in this way. There is no changes during the whole main acceleration upper arm and shoulder axis moved in the same way. No torque between shoulder and upper arm. And you see in the, fig in, the, in the figure there is no chance to go above zero degree to reach and torque between upper arm and shoulder. And you see in the pictures, of course you know this is nearly no torque between shoulder axis and upper arm and it means shoulder and upper arm are moved forward simultaneously. And that is what we not want. We must improve the beginning, the main acceleration from the acceleration of the shoulder. And I have an example, <laughs> it's not in your favor, <laughs> it's uh, to smile, <laughs> it's for fun. Uh, this is a woman, uh, she made a lot of mistakes and you see, according to topic, no chance to reach zero degree and you see it, yeah, no torque between shoulder and upper arm. She throws from the arm to accelerate the whole system, shoulder and upper arm together. A lot of mistakes, where should we begin is our questions. You can ask, why do you deal with it? <laughs> there is a, a simple solution. The question, who is this? She won a medal at the European Championships 2014 in Zurich. Do you know this woman? <laughs> no? <laughs> the solution is very simple. It is uh, Cindy Rowletter. She won. She won the bronze medal uh, about the, uh, in the 100 meter hurdles race. And <laughs> and she last year she changed to the heptathlon, and that's why <laughs> she must improve her javelin performance, and it's very difficult. It's a mark of our heptathlon women. All are bad in the javelin movement. And we have a lot to do with here in this way. <laughs> okay, then the acceleration of the javelin during the main acceleration phase cannot be measured exactly by the motion analysis. It's clear. We use the so-called tensor javelin at the diagnostics and in the training camp, not in competition. I will bring you tomorrow some results and some findings about this. Uh, it's very necessary <laughs> to measure the acceleration by using a special system. Some remarks to the quality of release. <laughs> you see, these are the results. The angle of release I mentioned, the angle of attitude, the angle of yaw, the angle of attack, and the angle of attitude at the touchdown of the brace leg. And there are no significant differences in the quality of release between the groups. Exception, the woman 55 to 60 meter. You see, they had a bad quality. But it's this 
is not expected. We expect it because of the higher uh, release speed that the angles of release will be smaller, but this is not the case. In tendency, the top SLEs have a higher angles of release, a smaller angles of attack, and smaller angles of yaw. This is in tendency, but this is not uh, significant. And you see uh, some pictures from our database. You see this is the aim, this is the objective. In the main acceleration up to the release to two half frames later, the long axis of the javelin should be one line. You see it in this way. This is very good. This is the objective. And this is, you see it, not good. And this is the result from a woman who reached the silver medal this year in Nanjing at the Youth Olympics. And you can imagine we have a lot to do with her. And she came from Leverkusen, and I will tomorrow tell to you all athletes from Leverkusen have the same problem. <laughs> 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 Linda Stahl, Katharina Molitor, Stevinerius in other times. And but we will discuss this problem, and we will try to put it away. And this is the quality of uh, release at the top view. And you see the objective uh, after the lateral backward movement, men more than women. The javelin should be lead into the drawing direction. You see it? This is the javelin, and it must, it has to be lead into the drawing direction. And this is an example for an deficit uh, for a task to change. And I have some examples, some top athletes, and we made it at the World Championships in Berlin. You see Andreas Torgelsen. It's a throw like from a javelin gun. He had an angle of release from 39 degrees and the angle of attitude 38.9 degrees. This was Andrea Torgelsen at his third, third throw, the second was similar. In the first throw, he had the same angle of release and angle of attitude are the same. 42 degrees, 42 degrees, a very big, a very high angle of release. Uh, remember the formula I mentioned to begin, it's very good, but not for the men, but he try to uh, increase this angle of release, but it was too steep and the javelin dropped down at 77 meters. And in the second attempt, he corrugated his javelin gun in the same way, angle and release and angle of attack are the same, and the angle of release was three degrees below at the angle of release in the first attempt. And I will tell you tomorrow something later because he was at the Nordic uh, co company and they made similar investigations and they found, he told me uh, in Chula Vista in 2011, and he found null degree, zero degree angle of attack, nearly at every throw. He had this perfect ability to throw the javelin. And I asked him, uh, what do you do in the training to improve or to get this ability? And I was surprised about the answer, but I tell it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if the answer is true, then we could put away uh, a lot of juice, <laughs> female <laughs> or male throwers. <laughs> And this is uh, an example of uh, Barbara Spodagova. It was at the world record, angle of release 34.5 degrees, angle of attitude 34.6 uh, degrees. It's perfect, zero, de uh, zero degree angle of attack. And in one year later in Berlin, she had nearly the same release speed, nearly the same release speed but you see the angle of release is 38.8 degree and the angle of attitude was 
44.7 degree. It's a bad quality of the release parameters and maybe this is one reason that he uh, decreased her performance in Berlin in comparison to this in Stuttgart. By the way, the aerodynamic quality at this I called, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, was 118% and in this throw it was 106%. And it's clearly at the world record from Jan Jelesny. The angle of release was 34.8 and the angle of attack was 35.4 degrees and the angle of uh, jaw was 7 degrees. And I can show you in my database nearly all figures, all data from Jan Jelesny are the best uh, of all athletes because of his uh, throwing distance and including also the quality of rallies. Okay, some uh, remarks as summary. First of all, top performances are characterized by higher CG velocities up to the touchdown of the brace leg without or nearly without loss bigger effect of the brace leg, higher amount of reduced CG velocity by more flat touchdown of the brace leg and more stable standing brace leg. Then we have a more forward movement of the right hip, base more activity in the support leg, leads at the same way, at the same delay of throw to a higher pretension in the trunk shoulder part of the body. This is important for the higher shoulder velocity, the parameter most influencing the release speed. And in tendency, we found higher angles of release, smaller angles of attack, smaller than three degrees, and smaller angles of jaw, smaller than 10 degrees at top athletes. And this is remarkable, I think. All results getting up today said if you increase your angle of release, the release, bill, uh, release speed will decrease. And we think over this connection, how can we increase the angle of release without loss or without reducing the release speed? It's our actual question. We have some very good results made with David Stoll. And uh, the base is, uh, there must be an additional work, an additional uh, lifting work. And where does this work come from? Not from the shoulder, not from the arm. Uh, we must produce it from other parts. And at David Stoll, it came from the legs, yes. This, this support leg have, has a larger activity in a smaller time, it's very complicated, but he can support, he can lift his main acceleration effectively to increase the angle of release. And we think over maybe the muscles in the neck and so on, what can we do in order to lift the main acceleration pass, in order to lift the main acceleration way, in order to increase the angle of release, without loss or without decreasing the angle, uh, the speed release. This is an actual important question. The movement analysis at competitions and diagnostics, inclusive the evaluation and the hints for the training, plays an important role in our training scientific support and counseling. I will take it tomorrow as uh, initial or starting point. According to the physical, physical abilities, besides others, are very important. And this is a training conclusions. Reactive and velocity abilities of the legs. And to ensure an individual optimum relation between strength, strength tension, and flexibility in the trunk and shoulder muscles. You will see it tomorrow. Uh, reactive and velocity abilities 
very, very important. And a lot of throwers came, uh, come to us when they are 19 or 20 years old. Never did a drop jump again and uh, before. Never did a drop jump before. And we told them how to do this, how to do it. And they have a bad quality, a bad level. And it's very, very difficult to improve the reactive abilities if you are 100 kilos heavy uh, or your body weight is above 100 kilos or about 100 kilos or at women about 85 kilos. We, it, it took a long time to improve this ability of, at Christine Husong. I will <laughs> tell you about this uh, example tomorrow because of your body weight. But we improved and we implement them in the training and she had last year for the first time a good development of her performance and I will think it will be increase in the future. And finally, because all speak about there are so much individual solutions, I think there are a lot of ways to throw 60 meters or 80 meters at the men, 60 meters at the women, but there are not so many ways to reach absolute top performances. Okay, that's my part. And now maybe there are some questions you can me ask later or you can me ask now. Thank you for your kindly attention. Thank you, Frank. You're